Okay, using units and solving problems. So this this is really important. So a conversion factor is a fraction. I have a friend who teaches uh, middle school math, and she tells me that fraction is the F word to a lot of her students. They don't like that fraction business. We have to become comfortable with fractions. So a conversion factor is a fraction. It's a fraction in which um, we have the same quantity expressed in one way on the numerator and another way in the denominator. So remember, the numerator is the top and the denominator is the bottom. The denominator is the downstairs. So we have this relationship. By definition, one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. So they describe the same quantity, the same length. right? One inch, about that much, is the same as 2.54 centimeters. Different names for the same thing. So when we write a conversion factor, what we're going to do is we're going to take this quantity expressed in inches and maybe put it on the top of our fraction. And we're going to put the same quantity expressed in a different unit on the bottom. So one inch over 2.54 centimeters. The top of this fraction is equal to the bottom of the fraction. They represent the same quantity. Everybody okay with that? What's anything divided by itself? One. So this is equal to one. It doesn't look like it's equal to one, but it is, because the top and the bottom are describing exactly the same thing. We could also write it the other way. We could put the 2.54 centimeters on the top and the one inch on the bottom. Is that also equal to one? Yeah. So these conversion factors, we've got the numerator and the denominator expressing the same quantity, just in different ways. And so conversion factors are always numerically equal to 1. Anybody have any questions about that? So if we multiply something by 1, does that change what it is? No. You can multiply by 1 all day long, and, and the number doesn't change. If you take 52 times 1, it's 52. 37 times 1. 37. doesn't change. So we can take a number or measurement like 12.00 inches and multiply it by 1 and it's not going to change what it represents. It's still 12 inches. So if I multiply this by 2.54 centimeters over 1 inch, this is equal to 1, right? So I'm not changing anything. So I got my calculator. 12 times 2.54. Calculator says 30.48. Um, what happens with those units? Units can be multiplied and divided like any variable, or like any number for that matter. So here I have inches times centimeters divided by inches. If I wanted to, I could extend this line and think of this as one giant fraction. And here I have inches on the top. Come on, pointer. Inches on the top and inches on the bottom. What's inch divided by inch? It cancels out. Poof, it's one. Gone. I'm going to cross them off. What unit is left? Centimeters. I just converted inches into centimeters. What about significant figures? How many 
many sig figs does 12.00 inches have? I think this was the question you had. I can, I can certainly see why you might see 12 inches, which we associate with one foot equals 12 inches, and think, oh, that's an exact number. But this is just a, a measurement of a, of a length. So 12 inches, that has four sig figs. This one, this one's a little tricky. We'll, we'll get to that, but we have to kind of talk about it right now, too. They, they redefined the inch to be exactly equal to 2.54 centimeters. So this is an exact relationship. Exact numbers do not limit the number of significant figures in your answer. So we don't even need to consider any sig figs here. This was four, and so our answer should have four, and it does, and so we're done. Any questions? Mm -hmm. That's a good question, and we will get to that. Um, conversions within the metric system, like millimeters to meters, are exact. Conversions within the English system, like inches to feet, are exact. Um, but with a few, very few exceptions, if you go back and forth, like if you do kilometers to miles, that's not exact. And the number of significant figures is going to depend on where you got the conversion factor from. We'll cover that again later as well. Any other questions? So here's sort of um, instructions for making conversion factors. You start with an equivalence statement. Something equals something else. Um, if you're converting from the English system to the metric system, you're probably going to look that up in a table. And I'm going to give you a useful card of information because uh, there's a bunch of this stuff in the back cover of the textbook, but we have an electronic textbook. So it's easier to carry around if you have some sort of a digital device, um, but you don't have the book to just flip open. So I'll give you a card with that written on there. Um, but the metric metric conversions, we memorize the prefixes, and so we can just write them down. We don't have to go looking them up. So you start with an equivalent statement, something equals something, and then you can always make two conversion factors. So you put what's on one side of the equal sign on the top and the other side of the equal sign on the bottom, and then you can also reverse it. So you can write two conversion factors from one equivalent statement. And the one you use... Um, is going to be the one where you have the unit you're trying to get on the top and the unit that you're trying to get rid of, the starting unit and the denominator. So this slide is meant as sort of kind of a reference. Um, that's something you might want to write in the back of your homework journal so you can refer to it easily. And all of these things are posted on Blackboard as um, the actual PowerPoint slides and as PDFs, uh, six slides to a page, so you can print those if you want to. Okay, here we go, sig figs and unit conversions. English-English uh, conversions are always exact. Metric-metric conversions are always exact. So one foot, the pointer is just not happy today. One foot equals 12 inches, that's an exact conversion. What that means is when we do a calculation and we use that as a conversion factor, we just don't even look at it for sig figs. We say, okay, that one's exact, I don't have to think about it. A yard is three feet. It's exact. Um, a kilometer is 10 to the third meters. That's a metric metric conversion. It's exact. So like any exact numbers, they don't limit the number of significant figures in the result. The ones going between the metric system and the English system, come on. Um, metric English, those involve a measurement, and so they're not exact. Um, one pound is 454 grams. Yeah, that's approximate. That's to the nearest gram. When you have a relationship like this, what we're saying is with the one, that's exact. Exactly one pound is approximately 454 grams. So if I use this conversion factor, it would limit my answer to at most three significant figures. 
a quart is approximately equal to 0 0.9463 liters. So that would limit my answer to, at most, four significant figures. Could I find more accurate, more precise conversion factors? I could. Right? What you want to do is you want to use a, a conversion factor that's not going to limit your answer. So if you're starting with a number that has five significant figures, you wouldn't want to use this relationship. You'd want to look for a better one because that's going to reduce um, the number of sig figs in your answer. Um, so these numbers will affect sig figs. Um, the only exact metric English conversion is that centimeters to inches. And you should know, you should memorize that relationship because it comes up a lot. One inch is exactly 2.54 centimeters, and that's not going to limit the answer. Back in 1958, they redefined the inch. Okay, the inch is exactly 2.54 centimeters. Any questions? Okay, dimensional analysis. Dimensional analysis is a technique, okay, and it is probably one of the most important things that you need to learn to be successful in chemistry. The, the problems that we're going to do today, um, you might be able to solve just kind of in your head because you intuitively understand units. And you'll get frustrated with me because I'm going to try to make you write it out my way. There's a reason that I'm doing that. Because in chemistry, you'll come up to more complicated problems and problems with units that you're not familiar with. And if you have this skill, then you'll be fine. If you don't have the skill, then in the, in the midst of trying to learn stoichiometry, you're going to also have to try to learn dimensional analysis. So we're going to learn dimensional analysis today. And then when we get to stoichiometry, um, you can just focus on learning that. So the basic steps here are you write down the unit that's asked for. So you read through the question, and it's going to ask you to, to give something in a certain unit. You need to write that down. And then you need to write down the given value. So, you know, like this, look, the last problem we did, we converted 12 inches into centimeters. The desired unit, the requested unit was centimeters. The given unit was inches. And then we're going to apply a unit factor, sometimes more than one, to that given value to get it to the final value. And so here it is in pictures. Um, you start by writing down, I'll use my finger. You start by writing down the units that are requested in the answer. Then you go back and you find out the units that are given to you in the problem, and then you figure out how you're going to get there. So we'll do an example. Now, you know, I've been talking about homework journals, and it's been a little sketchy. What are we really supposed to be writing in them? This is where you've got lots of stuff to write in your homework journal. So if you're doing a problem like this, um, dim use dimensional analysis to show how many seconds are in 3.55 minutes. Yes? So when we're doing our homework at home, we should be writing a lot of work on the journal? Any, any, any work that you're doing on the computer, I want you to show your work in the journal. Okay. Now, yeah, the Learn Smart, where they're having you do some problems. Yeah, if there's anything where you're having to like convert units or there's something writing down, you should write that, do all your work in the journal. Now, some of those questions are at just having you drag and drop things, identify number of significant figures. There's not really any work to show for that. You'll get the homework journal signed at the end of activity session each day. Okay, and, and the reason for that is I want, I want some marker for myself that you stayed to the end, that you didn't just sign in and take off, okay, because there's credit associated with that. There's 10% credit for activity session, and that mostly comes from did you stay. So the homework journal is how I'm going to keep track of that you stayed. 
getting you to show it to me, then I can take a quick look at it and see if you're getting it or not and correct those things right away. The goal of it is not to give you busy work. I do not want you to copy down the question. I don't want you to necessarily write out complete sentence answers or anything like that. I think that's kind of silly. I think you should have the chapter and the problem number written down so that if you go back to that problem later, you can find your work. Or if you didn't come up with the right answer, you have questions, you can show me your work. I can look at your work and figure out what's going wrong in your brain. It's like, oh, you've got this misconception. Let's fix it. Okay, so that's the idea behind the, the homework journal. So at home, you should be using it as well. Now, if you don't write every single question down in there, you know, all your work, am I actually going to notice? Probably not. If you're not writing anything down, I definitely will notice. Okay. So let's do this one. So we read the question first. Use dimensional analysis to show how many seconds are in 3.55 minutes. I know that some of you can do this without writing it down. The purpose here is to learn how to write it down when it's units we understand so that we can write it down when there are units we don't understand. So what are they asking us to find? Seconds. So here's this question. How many seconds? So we want seconds. And then we find, okay, here's the number, 3.55 minutes. That's the only unit given in the problem, so that must be where we're starting. So minutes. So we're going to convert from minutes to seconds. We can do this in one step if we know the relationship between minutes and seconds, which I think most of us do. We know that one minute is equal to 60 seconds. So then we write down the number, 3.55 minutes, and we're going to apply a conversion factor. That's a fraction. We're going minutes to seconds. We want seconds, so we want to put seconds on the top, and we want to put <coughs> excuse me, minutes on the bottom. Because then minutes will cancel with minutes, and they'll go away and we'll be left with seconds. Dimensional analysis, the dimension is the unit. So it's analyzing and solving a problem by looking at the units. And it's probably the most important thing I learned how to do in high school. I learned it as a junior in physics class. And I would say it's the most important thing I learned in all of high school. It's pretty important. So we got the units in. Now we make this conversion factor from our equivalent statement. So one minute is equal to 60 seconds. I looked at the units to tell me which one goes on top and which one goes on the bottom. I can't separate the 60 and the seconds. I need to put the 60 with the seconds, so that goes on the top, and one minute goes on the bottom. The top has to equal the bottom. One second does not equal 60 minutes, does it? That's a common mistake. Students will put the number in the wrong place. Okay, so now I've got my units in place, and I've got my numbers, and now I just use my calculator and do the math. 3.55 times 60. And I know that a lot of you could have done this in your head. It's not the point. Calculator says 213, and the unit left is seconds. Then we have to look at significant figures. Is this relationship exact? Is it defined? Yeah. It is. It is defined. We're not going between metric and English units. Actually, time, um, seconds and minutes, really is kind of universal. So this is a defined quantity. That means those numbers are exact, so we don't even have to think about them. How many sig figs in the starting number? Three. So I should have three in the answer, and it came out that way. So here's my answer. Any questions? Let's do another one. What is the mass in grams of a 325 milligram aspirin tablet? What did they want us to find? Grams. And what did they give us? 
milligrams. So we'd like to go from milligrams to grams. We need the relationship between them. Now, you don't absolutely have to write the equivalent statement down. That's kind of up to you. I'm going to write it down here at the beginning. So I've got milli, gram, and what does milli mean? 1 times 10 to the negative 3. 1 times 10 to the minus 3 grams. So 1 milligram is equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 3 grams. I don't have to look that up. I memorize milli, and I can just write it out. So we take 325 milligrams, and I want a conversion factor in here. So I'm starting with milligrams, and I'm going to grams. This is the unit I want. That goes on the top, and milligrams goes on the bottom because I want it to go away. I want it to cancel out. If I divide milligrams by milligrams, it cancels. Units come first, and then numbers. Now that I've got the units in place, I look at this equivalent statement, whether I wrote it down or I've just got it in my head. I have one milligram on the bottom, and one times 10 to the minus third grams on the top. And you do that on your calculator, and you'll come up with 0.325 grams. Is this conversion factor exact? Yes, it is. It's within the metric system. So then for sig figs, I look at my starting number, which had three sig figs, and my answer should have three sig figs. Any questions? I'll take that as a no. So, if you're going on a long trip, you drove to Minnesota last summer, you don't just get in the car and drive. Usually you want to have at least some clue about where you're going, right? If nothing else, you want to know, where, where am I trying to end up, right? So you get on Google Maps, and, and you figure out where you're going to go, and, and what route you're going to take, are we going to go, you know up through uh, Donner Pass, are we going to go down south through the desert, how are we going to get there? You make a plan. We want to do the same thing when we solve chemistry problems. You need to identify where you're going, right? Where am I going to end up? That's the unit that they're asking you for. You need to know where you're starting. You know, you go to the, a big mall and you, you get lost and, and you go look at the kiosk and the map. And it always has this little red, you are here. Because you can't figure out how to get somewhere else if you don't know where you are. Where you are is equivalent to the unit that's given in the problem. And then you need to plan how you're going to get there. Now, the two examples that we've done so far were pretty simple. And we knew a relationship between the units, and so we could do it in one step. But sometimes it gets more complicated, and you need more steps. And so that's where you come up with a plan. Um, just like there's more than one way to get from Reedley to um, Coon Rapids, Minnesota, there's often more than one way to get from the starting unit to the ending unit. And how you go will depend on what sorts of conversion factors you either have in your head or have available to you. So you could do a problem correctly, and it might look different than the solution that I've written out or different than the neighbor, your neighbor's solution. We should still get the same answer, though. OK, so let's do something a little more complicated. What if we're doing metric conversions where both of the units have prefixes? So um, like in this example, um, we're starting with deciliters, and we're going to milliliters. Both of the units have prefixes. So there's two prefixes. That means you should do this in two steps. If you have one prefix, you can do it in one step. This is not the only way to do it, but this is how I do it, because the other way is, is just requires way too much thinking. So this is how we're going to do it. Um, definitely draw a map so you don't get lost. So let's do this example. So the requested unit is what? 
milliliters. The question is, a hospital has 125 deciliters of blood plasma. What is the volume in milliliters? So we're trying to find milliliters. And what is the unit that we're starting with? Deciliters. So I look at those two units. They're both um, variations of liter, right? This one has a prefix, and that one has a prefix. Two prefixes, two steps. What we're going to do is we're going to go from deciliter to the liter without a prefix, and then we're going to go from liter to the other prefix. And it's maybe not the most elegant way, but it's fast and it's sure, and you won't get lost. Okay, so deciliters to liters to milliliters. That's the path that we're going to take. That's our map. So now we start with um, 125 deciliters. And this path, I see two arrows. Each arrow is a conversion factor. So I'm going to need two fractions here. So I'm going to put those in. And then this path tells me the units that go in the numerator. I'm going deciliters to liters to milliliters. So down here I've got deciliters to liters to milliliters. I figured out the path, and then that's what goes on the top of all my fractions. So for this one, what I want to do is I want to get rid of the previous unit. So I'm going to put deciliter down here so that I can cross them off. Deciliter divided by deciliter equals one, poof, cancels out, goes away. And then I'm going to put liter down here, and the liters will cancel out. Everybody okay with that? All the units in place. Now I look for numbers. Well, the relationship between deciliters and liters. I need to know what deci stands for. Deci stands for 1 times 10 to the minus 1. So I've got deci on the bottom. I need the top and the bottom of this conversion factor to be equal. So if deci's on the bottom, I'm going to write what it means on the top. So 1 times 10 to the minus 1 is equal to 1 deciliter. Okay, so what I did before is I did deci is equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 1, and then I put liter in here, and that was 1. So if you want to do it that way, that's fine. I've got one deciliter is equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 1 liter. If you follow this pattern, you're never going to have the deci and the, the prefix of any kind with a factor of 10. Never. They're always going to be on opposite sides. So then over here, milli, liter, and liter, am I going to put the power of 10 in the numerator with milli or in the denominator? Well, let's think about it this way. I need my conversion factor to equal 1, right? So if I had milliliter over milliliter, 1 milliliter divided by 1 milliliter, does that equal 1? Sure it does. Well, what if instead of milli, I put what milli stands for? Milli is an abbreviation for 1 times 10 to the minus 3. So if I erase milli, and write what it means. Is that still equal to 1? Yeah. So I've got what it means on one side of the fraction and the prefix on the other side of the fraction. Every single time. So what I need here then, I've got milli on the top. I have 1 milliliter, then I have 1 times 10 to the minus 3, what milli means in the denominator. Any questions? There will be lots of questions later. It's OK. This is where knowing how to do scientific notation in your calculator is important. Okay, we covered that yesterday. So I'm going to take the 125. After I've got all my numbers in place, I'm just going to go left to right. I'm going to multiply by the top and divide by the bottom. Multiply by the top. Divide by the bottom. 
Some students feel more comfortable if they actually multiply by one and divide by one and get everything. That's fine. Personally, I don't do it, but it's fine. Because multiplying and dividing by one doesn't change it. But I'm going to take 125 times, and then I'm going to enter this number in scientific notation. 1EE e minus 1. Might be 1EXP minus 1, or 1 and then that times 10 to the X button which is different than the 10 to the X button. But some of the Casio calculators had a times 10 to the X button. Um, divided by 1 times 1, and then divided by 1 EE e minus 3, press the equal sign, write down what the calculator says. 1, 2, 5, 0, 0. And the only unit that didn't get crossed out was milliliters. Let me get this out of the way. Come up with that number? Okay. Are these conversion factors exact? Yes. They're within the metric system. They're exact. I don't need to think about them. How many sig figs did my starting number have? Three. My ending number should have three. This answer is okay. Not great. It's okay, because we've got ambiguous zeros. It would be better to put this in scientific notation, 1.25 times 10 to the fourth milliliters. Any questions? This is one of those things that, um, it's like watching, I, I watched my son play baseball last night. You know, you watch them play baseball, and they make it look easy, right? These guys are hitting the ball. Just hitting the ball, and catching the ball, and throwing the ball. It's like, oh, it looks so easy, right? You go out there, and you try to do it, and you haven't played baseball in a really, really long time, and it's like, oh, man. This is like, wow, it's hard, right? So you, you can sit here and watch me do this. I do this for a living, okay? So I get a lot of comments, well, it looks so easy when you did it. Well, yeah, I've been practicing, right? It's going to require some practice. You're going to make mistakes. It's going to feel hard. But if you want to succeed, you're all in here for a reason. There's some career goal that you have that requires that you learn some chemistry. Keep the goal in mind. Don't give up because of some stupid little units. Okay? I will work with you as hard as you're willing to work with me. We are just not even covering everything that needs to be covered today. It's okay. We'll press on. Okay, so here's two more examples. Do you feel like you need more examples? Yeah? Let's do one of these. Which one do you want me to do? The top one or the bottom one? Oh, yeah. Let's do the bottom one because the top one, that doesn't really belong here. This isn't supposed to be with two prefixes. We'll do the one on the bottom. So here is a, a word problem without most of the words. Um, it just says, perform the following conversions. So we're going to convert centimeters to megameters. So I'm trying to find megameters. That's where I'm going. And I'm starting with centimeters. I'm starting with centimeters because that's the one that has a number with it. How many prefixes are in these units? Two. Two. So how many steps do I need? Two. Two. So I need two steps. I'm going to have something in the middle. What's it going to be? It's going to be the unit without a prefix, right? So I'll go centimeters to meters and then meters to millimeters. This is not the only way, but it's the way that works the best for students. So 7.624 times 10 to the third centimeters. I look at the path I set out for myself. Centimeters to meters to megameters. Two arrows, two fractions. And then I make sure that I have these units in the numerator. Centimeters, okay I've already got that one written down. Centimeters and then the next one is meters and then megameters. 
I made a plan, and I'm just following the plan. What unit do I put down here under meters? Centimeters. centimeters. I want the previous unit to cancel out. I didn't want centimeters. I want it to go away. Now I've got meters in there, and I want meters to go away. So over here, I'm going to divide by meters. Everybody okay? Now I put in what those prefixes mean. It doesn't matter what order you do them in. If you want to do the last one first, let's just do that for fun. What does mega mean? It's big, right? It's a million. 10 to the 6. So 1 megameter is 1 times 10 to the 6 meters. The prefix is on the top. The 10 to the something is on the bottom, on the other side. Never put them together. What does centi mean? 10 to the negative 2. So centi's on the bottom. I want to put what it means on the top. 10 to the minus 2. There's one. So on my calculator, 7.6, oh, it helps to get your hand in the right place, 7.624 EE3 times 1 EE minus 2 divided by 1 EE6 equals 0 0.00004076.24, 0, 0, 0. and then the unit will be the only one that I didn't cross off, megameters. These are exact conversions, so I don't need to think about them. The starting number had four sig figs. My ending number has four sig figs. Sometimes you wonder, well, should I put that in scientific notation? Um, if it doesn't specifically ask you, then I don't really care. Um, if it says write it in scientific notation, then you better do it. Kind of my rule of thumb is if I have to think about how many zeros there are, I'd rather have it in scientific notation. Four zeros is really on the edge. My eyes play tricks with me sometimes. I can see three zeros fine, but four... Sometimes you miscount five. Anytime you have to get your finger out and count digits, it makes you feel like you're in first grade or something, right? Put it in scientific notation. So I'm going to put this in scientific notation. One, two, three, four, five. So this would be 7.624 times 10 to the minus 5 megameters. Any questions? Compound units. Some measurements have ratios of units, like density. Um, density and speed. So what do you do if you need to convert those? So the speed limit on, on many highways is 55 miles per hour. How could you convert that to meters per second? The per is the fraction part. So what you do is you convert the miles to meters and you convert the hours to seconds separately. You can only convert one unit at a time. So let me show you how you do this. So 55 miles per hour. 55 miles per hour. That means miles divided by hours. Write it as a vertical fraction. So we have, we're given miles per hour, and they want meters per second. So I'm going to convert miles to meters, and then I'm going to convert hours to seconds, but I don't want to think too hard, so I'm actually going to go hours to minutes to seconds because I know the relationships. So here I've got a total of three arrows. 
up here, right? So I'm going to have three factors in here. You can really do them in any order you want, but I like to start with the top and then do the bottom. So first I'm going to go miles to meters. So miles to meters, and then to get the miles to cancel out, I'm going to put the miles in the denominator, and that's going to cancel out. Now I'm converting units in the denominator. Everything's going to be upside down. Because I've got hours down here, and I want to get minutes down here, and then seconds down here. So what I was doing here is I really have two separate conversions going on. I have a conversion in the numerator and a conversion in the denominator. So my denominator is going to be hours to minutes to seconds. It was in the bottom up here, and it's in the bottom down. Ooh, didn't mean to do that. Bottom down here. So how do I cancel hours? I don't divide by hours. I multiply by hours. So if I put hour up here, then I've got an hour in the top, and I have hour on the bottom, and they still cancel out. Everything's upside down now. And then if I want minutes to cancel out, I put minutes up here, and the minutes cancel there. And I'm left with seconds in the denominator, and meters in the numerator. Everybody OK with that? Yes? You could, yes. Would that make it easier because then you have you didn't have to convert the hour to minutes? You just have to do minutes to seconds. Yes, you absolutely could do that. Yep. So I've got all my units in, now I need some numbers. Um, I always like to start with the easy ones. So this one's easy. One minute is sixty seconds, right? And what's the relationship between hours and minutes? 60 minutes in an hour. Yeah, we definitely don't want to say that one minute is 60 hours. That would be backwards. Okay, what about meters and miles? I think you have that relationship on the top of your worksheet. Oh, it's kilometers. Dang. Okay, well... Um, is it, it's 1.60, what, 609? Okay, so we need the relationship. So one mile is equal to 1609 meters. I'm just going to just flat out tell you that. You could look it up. If we didn't have access to that, we'd have to add another step here. If we only had miles to kilometers, then we'd have to do miles to kilometers and then to meters. I don't want to do it. So one mile is 1609 meters. And so we got 55. 55 times 1609 divided by 60 divided by 60 equals... Calculate this is 24.5819 and a whole bunch of fours. What's the unit? I have to look back and see what I didn't cancel out. I didn't cancel meters and I didn't cancel seconds. So we've got meters per second. How many significant figures should that have? Two. Why? Because there's two in the 55. 55 miles per hour. This 1609 meters to one mile is not exact, but it has four significant figures, which is more than our starting number did. And these last two are exact. So this should have two sig figs, and so we're going to call that 
25 meters per second. Any questions? I think we better do another example. You want another example of compound units? What the heck are they doing over there? Okay. Bromine has a density of 3.12 grams per milliliter. What is the density in pounds per gallon? First, we identify where are we going. What unit are we trying to find? What is the density in pounds per gallon? So pounds over gallon. And then what, did we, what are we starting with? Come on, help me out here. Grams per milliliter, thank you. So we have to figure out how to get from grams per milliliter to pounds per gallon. Take them individually. Okay, so let's just continue this fraction line. We want to go from grams to pounds. Well, we were provided with a couple of conversion factors here. This directly relates pounds and grams. So we could go directly from grams to pounds. Well, that's the case. Then let's look at the other one, milliliters to gallons. Well, they gave us that one gallon is approximately 3.785 liters. That's not a relationship between milliliters and gallons. Well, if we got liters, could we get to gallons from liters? Yeah, we could use this that they gave us. Can we get from milliliters to liters? Sure we can. We know what milli means, right? So there we go. So I have, again, three arrows. So I've got my density here of 3.12 grams over milliliters. I'm going to have three fractions. So I like starting with the top. So the top is grams to pounds. So I'm going to do grams to pounds, and I want to divide by grams so the grams cancel out. In the denominator, I'm going milliliters to liters to gallons. So I've already got milliliters. I'm going to put liters and gallons here. That's the path in the bottom, milliliters to liters to gallons. And then I want these units to cancel out, so I'm going to put milliliter up here, so it cancels with the milliliter over there. And then I'm going to put liter up here, so it cancels that liter. And now my unit, my units that are left, I've got pounds in the numerator and gallons in the denominator. Any questions? Other than what the heck are they doing on the other side of the wall? Okay, so let's do this first one. The relationship between pounds and grams. That, that was given to us. One pound is approximately 454 grams. So exactly one pound is 454 grams with three significant figures. So one pound... 454 grams. The other relationship they gave us was between gallons and liters. That was the last one. 3.785 liters is one gallon. The middle one is using a metric prefix. I've got milli on the top, and so I need to write what milli means on the bottom. 
Milli means 1 times 10 to the minus third. So I've got a 1 on the top. So I take my calculator, 3.12, multiply by the top, which is 1, divide by the bottom, which is 454, multiply the top of the next one is 1, divide by 1 EE e minus 3, multiply by the top, 3.785, divide by 1, equals. Calculator is giving me 26. 0, 1, 1, 4, 5, that's more than enough digits. The middle conversion factor is exact. It's a metric. Metric, metric. This is metric English. How many sig figs in that last one? 3.785 has how many significant figures? 4. So that's got 4 sig figs. And the 454 grams has how many? Three. And the number I started with had how many? Three. So my answer should have three significant figures. So two, six, and the zero. So I would report this as 26.0 pounds per gallon. I think it's always a good idea to write down at least a bunch of what your calculator shows you because if you rounded incorrectly, if you chopped off too many digits and you realize your mistake later, you've, you've got the original number there and you can go back and fix it. If you, you know, if you just wrote down 26 or if you rounded it to 30 and you come back later, you're going to have to do the calculation all over again. Any questions? We do have five minutes left. We're going to use them. Okay, compound units can act as conversion factors. They are generally conversion factors that are not always true. They're only true in a certain circumstance. Um, but things like density um, and speed, they've got compound units. Density relates mass and volume, and speed relates distance and time. So let's do an example using density as a conversion factor. You can also use the density equation, but I think using density as a conversion factor for most density-related problems is better. You don't have to rearrange the equation for one thing. So here's our question. An automobile battery contains 1,275 milliliters of acid. If the density of battery acid is 1.84 grams per milliliter, how many grams of acid are in an automobile battery? So we read all the words. And now we, we look at, well, in the question, what are the units they're talking about? How many grams? So that's what I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find grams. And then I've got two different numbers here with units. I'm going to write them up here because I didn't leave myself much space. 1275 milliliters. And then this density, 1.84 grams over liters. No, nope, milliliters. So it's written with a slash here because that's easier to type. But I want you to write it as a vertical fraction so that you recognize that is a fraction. So this one, it's not necessarily obvious which number do we start with. The unit we're trying to end up with is just a single unit. It's not a compound unit, something per something. That means that we should start with a single unit. We want to start with the milliliters. Milliliters cannot be used as a conversion factor. Grams per milliliter can be used as a conversion factor. So if you're not sure what to start with, start with the one, the number that has the simple unit. And move this. So we're trying to get to grams, and we're going to start with milliliters. The density gives us a direct relationship between the mass and the volume for the battery acid. 
So we can go directly grams to milliliters. So we start with our one point, you know, our 1,275 milliliters. My path there has one arrow. That means I have one fraction. This is milliliters to grams. So I want milliliters to grams. And then I want to put milliliters in the denominator so that the units cancel out. Now I'm going to look at my density. The number is with gram. It needs to stay with it. So I'm going to have 1.84 grams in the numerator. And then some students are bothered by the fact that there's no number in the denominator. If you want a number there, put the 1. So now I just take my 1275 times 1.84, and I come up with 2346 grams. How many significant figures should that have? I started with how many? I started with four. Is this an exact conversion factor? I don't really expect you to know the answer at this point. Well, let's think about it. How do you find the density of something? By measuring it. You measure the mass, you measure the volume, and you divide them. So is this a defined relationship? It's, it's measured. I mean, we define density as mass over volume, but we have to measure the mass and we have to measure the volume. That means there's uncertainty in it. So this only has three significant figures. So this one has four, and this one has three. And so the density here limits our answer. So how should we report that? Two, three, five. Two, three, five. 235? Two, three, five. Or 2,350 grams. If you put this in scientific notation, because here we're rounding in the tens place, so we need to be careful. We do 2346 times 10 to the third. And we want to keep this. Now we don't have to worry that we're going to uh, do something silly when we just chop numbers off. So when you're rounding in the tens place or higher, it's a great idea to put it in scientific notation before you round it. And that will avoid you making dumb, dumb mistakes. Any questions?